السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ توحید و سنت ڈاٹ کام الحمد للہ رب العالمین والصلاة والسلام على اشرف الانبیاء والمرسلین سیدنا و نبینا محمد و علی آلہ و اصحابہ و ازواجہ و تابعین و من تبعہم بحسان الى یوم الدین اما بعد Continuing with the same topic of the seer of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we were discussing the background of Arabs and how different religions got into Arabia. And in that regard we were talking about Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa salam being ordered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to leave his family in the desert that is called Mecca now and then occasionally he used to visit his family we talked about one of his visits when he was ordered to offer his son Sayyidina Ismail alayhi salatu was salam as a sacrifice to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at another occasion when Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam went to visit his family. At that time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had ordered Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam to build the Kaaba with the help of his son Ismail alayhi salatu was salam. Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam started building the Kaaba The place of the Kaaba that was assigned to Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam was not a new location where he had to start a new foundation Although Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam is known to be the one who have built the Kaaba, who constructed this Kaaba, but in reality Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam built the Kaaba on the same foundations that were there, but they were wiped out and they were covered by dust and dirt. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made a cloud to go and have and be at a place of the Kaaba. So the shed of the cloud was getting exactly at the location of the Kaaba. And in some other narrations it says that Sayyidina, Jibrahim, Sayyidina Jibreel alayhi salatu was salam came and he marked the place of the foundation of the Kaaba. Whichever of the two took place, Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam, along with the help of his son Ismail alayhi salatu was salam, started digging the Kaaba, digging the foundation and the place of that foundation, until he found the old foundation that was there. Where the foundation was from, and what's the history of that foundation, inshallah, I'll come back to it in a minute. Let's finish talking about the construction of Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam. Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam, as he found that foundation, he started building the Kaaba. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala points out this thing in Quran al-Kareem. وَإِذْ بَوَّأْنَا لِإِبْرَاهِيمَ مَكَانَ الْبَيْتِ And remember, when we showed Ibrahim the site of this house, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that not only that we ordered him, we showed him the exact site of the Kaaba. And then we ordered him to build the Kaaba and the ayah goes on. As Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam is building it, now he's a stage where the Kaaba is being built up to his height. So how is he going to put the stones on top of that place? 
So he's looking for a rock that he can stand on. And finally him and his son Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam, both of them were able to locate a big rock that's suitable for standing on it. They pushed it by the Kaaba. And Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, stood on, that, on top of that rock. As soon as he stood on the rock and is trying to reach up to put that brick or stones up there, that rock received an order from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to function like an elevator for Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. And now, that rock started going up and down according to the wish of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam and according to his need. And here we can see if anyone is to write the history of elevators, we can find the first elevator that we know in the history with no need of any electricity, any power, no buttons in it, works with the feeling, and not only just the words, with the feeling and according to the feeling of the person who's writing it. And it goes up, up and down. That was one miracle of Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam and the second one that we see up to this day are the footprints that are on that rock. Normally when you stand on a rock you don't get your foot footprints marked on it. It's not dust, it's a rock. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made that place where Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salatu was was standing on that rock, he made the footprints of Ibrahim alayhi salatu was to remain at that place. And up to this day people who go over there visit Makkah Mukarrama, they are able to see the footprints of Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salatu was on that rock. And therefore that place is called Maqam Ibrahim. The place of the standing of Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he went to Makkah Mukarrama from Medina, and he performed tawaf, it was the time to perform two rak'ah. Sayyidina Umar radiyallahu anhu said, Ya Rasulullah, لَوِ اتَّخَذْتَ مِن مَقَامِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ مُصَلَّى How about you perform these two rak'ahs at Maqam Ibrahim? And right then and there, the ayah of the Quran al Karim was revealed to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, confirming of what Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu said, وَاتَّخِذُوا مِن مَقَامِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ مُصَلَّى Take the maqam of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa salam as a place of salah. And we know from the hadith, Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu was blessed with, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the type of Ilm, knowledge that he used to, a feeling used to come to him. And he would feel that, how about doing it this way? And an eye of Quran al Karim will, will reveal, confirming what Umar radiallahu anhu had said. Umar radiallahu anhu. For this reason was given the title of Al-Faruq. The person who very easily distinguishes between Haq and Batil. Truth and falsehood. He can see it. Now for example, when I, there are many other examples of Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu saying something. For example, the ayah of hijab. And many other examples. Where he said something and the ayah of Quran al-Kareem was revealed. Confirming what Umar radiallahu anhu said. But when you look at this one. That where to perform the salah? I mean to us, in reality it makes no difference where we are going to perform the salah. It's the Kaaba, you forget about everything else over there. And you say, let's just perform the salah somewhere. And if we were to think of a place, we will say, Ya Rasulullah, how about going inside the Kaaba and doing it? And subhanallah, what made Umar radiallahu anhu have that feeling? No, it should be Maqam Ibrahim. All we can say about it is, is the 
knowledge that he was blessed and the understanding that he was blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with. Talking about his title of Al Faruq, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Quran a very important point about it. Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu, in tattaku allaha yaj'allakum furqana. O you who believe, if you have the taqwa of Allah, Allah will give you furqan. What is this furqan? It's the same ability of distinguishing between haqq and batil. Umar radiallahu anhu was on the peak of that. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that in order to acquire that knowledge, that ability of distinguishing between haqq and batil, you have to have the taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Live the type of taqwa and I will give you that understanding of distinguishing between haqq and batil. يَجْعَلْ لَكُمْ فُرْقَانًا so, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam performed the salah at Maqam Ibrahim. Nowadays, for those who have visited Makkah Mukarrama, and those who did not visit at least have seen the pictures of it, you would see that Maqam Ibrahim, the location of Maqam Ibrahim, where it is now, is not where it was at that time, at the time of Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. At the time of Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, of course, it was just next to Kaaba. Because he was standing on it to reach the Kaaba and to keep on building it. And the stone was going up and down. Then once, during the time of Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi wasalam, a flood came that pushed this rock back. And you can see, that's another miracle from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That had Maqam Ibrahim been at the same place where it was at that time, it would have been difficult for, pe- for people to perform tawaf over there. But as it went back, now at least it's out of the people's way when they're performing tawaf. At, and there is good room for people to perform tawaf within that area. And of course now when people get crowded, then they even go beyond that place. So the maqam of Ibrahim, the, that rock that we find nowadays, is not at the place where it was, it's behind, but it's still that whole area is con- considered to be maqam Ibrahim, alayhi salatu wasalam. As he constructed the Kaaba, with the help of Ismail, alayhi salatu wasalam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them another stone. And that is, Al-Hajar al-Aswad, the black stone. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in a hadith that when this black stone came down, it was white, and the hadith is in Sunan al-Tirmizi. It was white. فَسَوَّدَتْهُ خَطَايَا بَنِي Adam, As it pulls the sins of human beings. So through the sins of the people, the color of it got dark. In another hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, huwa yaminullahi fil ard. This black stone is just like the hand of Allah on this earth. And therefore, when we go over there, if we are able to reach it, then we are supposed to kiss it. When you see a great person, a respectable person, we shake hands with that person and then we might kiss that person's hand. So, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, it's just like that. Of course, it doesn't mean it's the hand of Allah, but as a respect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we go there, we kiss the black stone, if, and the person is not able to kiss the stone, then you just point to it from far, and that also helps in the same way as kissing it, because it's crowded, we are not allowed to push, push people over there, so just point towards it, saying, Bismillah, Allahu Akbar, and... Just by doing that, it pulls our sins. In another hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, the black stone and Maqam Ibrahim, both of these stones are from Jannah. And these were two pearls in the Jannah. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took the shine of it away. Otherwise, they would have lightened up the whole world. According to this, we know that then there are three places in Makkah and Medina that are from Jannah. Maqam Ibrahim, according to this hadith, and the black stone, as we know it from many hadith, and in Medina Munawwara, the place between the member of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the house of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that whole area is from Jannah. And this is why it's called Riyadhul Jannah, the garden of Jannah. The black stone, as we have it nowadays, is not complete as it came down. Nowadays, all we have is small pieces of it. Why? What happened to it? Inshallah, we'll talk about it later on. As we will come to, we will talk about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam constructing the Kaaba or putting the black stone in its place, inshallah, once we get to there, we will talk in more detail about the black stone. Coming back to the construction of the Kaaba, Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam built the Kaaba on the same foundations that were there. So where did that foundation come from? According to Alama Anusi rahimahullah, who writes in his tafsir and Many other muhaddisin, mufassireen have written this in their books of history and tafasir. That Kaaba was constructed altogether about 11 times. And this is talking about main construction of the Kaaba, building the whole Kaaba. Otherwise, just repairing it, of course, that took place many times over the years. But the first time Kaaba was built, before even human beings existed on this earth. That was by the angels. That was the first time Kaaba was built by the angels. And as we know from the history, that jinns used to live in the world. They used to live here before us. And they were supposed to do the tawaf of the Kaaba or face towards the Kaaba at that time. Then of course, by the age and by the time, it was demolished and it fell down. And Sayyidina Adam alayhi salatu wasalam reconstructed the Kaaba on the same foundations that was built by the angels. And histories show that although Kaaba was built 11 times throughout this period, but always the foundation remained the same, and that is the foundation, that is the same foundation that was built by the angels before human beings were even created. So Sayyidina Adam alayhi salatu wasalam built it. Then one of his sons, Sheath alayhi salatu wasalam, built the Kaaba. Then after the flood that was there during the time of Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam, Someone built it after that also. Then Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam built the Kaaba with the help of his son Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam. Then there was another nation after that that was called Al-Amaliqa. They also reconstructed the Kaaba. After Amaliqa, there was a clan of Jurhum who were in charge of the Kaaba. They reconstructed the Kaaba. After that there was need to reconstruct it again, once again and there was a person called Qusay bin Kilab. Inshallah, we'll talk about him later on. He also reconstructed the Kaaba. That was eight. And ninth time was during the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. About five years before he received the first revelation. When the kuffar of Quraysh were building the Kaaba. It was demolished at that time. And uh, they were building it. At that time when they were building the Kaaba, they made three major changes into the Kaaba, into the construction of the Kaaba. That were different from the construction of Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. The first change was 
they raised the door of the Kaaba up high so that they will control who would get into the Kaaba. They won't allow every person to go in there. Number two, at the, when Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam built the Kaaba, he made two doors to it, opposite to each other, so that people will enter from one side and they will come out of the other side. But the kuffar of Quraysh at that time, they decided to keep only one door and again for the same reason of having a control over who would be allowed to go into the Kaaba and then the person who is in charge of allowing people to go into the Kaaba will have that honor that he will allow only whoever he wants and the number of people that he wants. And number three, the major change was the Kuffar of Quraysh in spite of being kuffar, in spite of being idol worshippers, they decided that this is the house of Allah. We cannot use haram earning in building the house of Allah. We only want to use our haram, in, our halal income. So anyone that is doing anything that is haram and according to their understanding haram because they had some information from the uh, deen of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. So they said, whoever is having any haram earning, don't bring it here for the construction of the Kaaba. So as they started building it, their halal income wasn't enough to build the whole Kaaba the way it was. So then they decided to make it a little shorter and then they built a wall around it that is called Hatim. And this is why when we perform the Tawaf of the Kaaba, you go outside of the Hatim to perform the Tawaf because even that area is part of the Kaaba. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went to Makkah Mukarramah, Aisha radiyallahu anha requested, Ya Rasulullah, I like to perform two rak'ah salah inside the Kaaba. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam took her in the inside of Hatim and he said, this is also part of the Kaaba, this is inside the Kaaba, go ahead and perform this two rak'ah over here. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wanted this Kaaba to be built on the same way that was built by Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, eliminate these three changes. Bring the door down, make two doors, and then expand the Kaaba so that up to Hatim there will be a Kaaba, not only just that wall over there. Once he said to Aisha radiallahu anha, I feel like doing it. The only thing that stops me from doing it is that most of the people are new converts to Islam and they will start saying, look, he's demolishing the Kaaba. He has no respect for Ibrahim alayhi salam. So that in order to keep these people intact with Islam and not to allow them to have any doubts about me or about Islam, therefore I'm not doing it at this time. But this was his hope to do it. Sayyidina Abdullah bin Zubair radiallahu anhu when he ruled Makkah Mukarrama for some time, he knew that this is what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam wanted. So he reconstructed the Kaaba according to how it was at the time of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasallam, and of course according to how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam wanted it to be. This was the tenth time when Kaaba was reconstructed by Sayyidina Abdullah bin Zubair radiallahu anhu. And if you remember the history, there was a conflict between Abdullah bin Zubair and Hajjaj bin Yusuf. In fact, the ruler of the time, Marwan. So, when Hajjaj bin Yusuf took over Makkah Mukarramah, he did not want people to remember Abdullah bin Zubair radiallahu anhu by the construction of the Kaaba. So he demolished it and build it again the way it was built by Quraysh. 
during the time of Imam Malik rahimahullah. So now the construction of Hajjad bin Yusuf was the 11th time. During the time of Imam Malik rahimahullah, one of the rulers, either Harun or Rashid or Mansur, they wanted to reconstruct the Kaaba the way Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa wanted it and the way it was built by Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, and then by Abdullah bin Zubair radiyallahu anhu. When he asked Imam Malik rahimahullah, Imam Malik rahimahullah gave his fatwa, is not allowed to do that anymore. He said, لا أحب أن تكون لعبة الملوك I don't want this to be the game of the rulers and of the kings. That every king will come, one of them will say, Oh, this is how it was at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. This is how we are going to make it. And the next one will come, he say, No, this is how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam wanted it to be. And it was built by Ibrahim alayhi salam. This is how I'm going to make it. And people will just make this as a game for kings and rulers. Everyone in order to be remembered, will use one of these excuses. He said, from now on, no one should touch the Kaaba. May Allah bless Imam Malik rahimahullah. He saved the Kaaba from really being that type of game for the kings where everyone would come and just use it for his, his, own, his own pride and for his name. Now, no one does that and no one dares to demolish the Kaaba anymore. All the Jews, whenever there is any time to fix anything over there, then they will just do that work on the Kaaba. But since then, no one uh, demolished the Kaaba in order to rebuild it again on a different way. Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam, as he used to come to Makkah Mukarramah, visiting his family, this was one of his visits when he was ordered to build the Kaaba. Another very interesting visit, there are many of his visits in the history, but another very interesting of his visits was a time when he came and Sayyidina Ismail والسلام, wasn't in Mecca. So he met the wife of Ismail والسلام, which means his daughter-in-law. He asked her how they were doing. And she complained that we are not doing very good here. It's not really a good place to be at. And whatever hardships, difficulties they were going through, she mentioned it to him. So after hearing all of her stories, he said to her, very good, when your, son, when your husband comes, tell him that, give him my message to change the frame or the threshold of his door. So when Sayyidina Ismail alayhi salam came back, she informed him that a person came and he was asking of how we were doing. Of course, she didn't mention all the details of what she said, but finally she gave him the message. So as soon as he got the message, he asked her, what did you say to him? And nothing. Well, you must say something to him. He said, he asked me how we were doing and I just told him how we were doing. Did you say good or bad? And she said, yeah, you know, our, you know our situation. What good I can say about the situation? Okay. You know who, what's the frame of the door? That's you. So in other words, he asked me to change you. So, and that's my father. Go back to your home. And he got married to another one at another time when Sayyidina Ibrahim salam came. And that was a similar situation that he came and Ismail salam is not there. Again, as he went to his home, asked his wife about him. She said he went out. And again, he asked her the same questions, how they were doing. And she said, MashaAllah, Alhamdulillah, we are doing very good. And she admired her husband and she thanked Allah for whatever they have. At that time, he said to her, when your husband comes back, tell him, give him my message that to keep the same 
frame of the door not to change it. So when he came back, she told him everything and she said, she gave him the message. So she said, you are the frame of the door. You must have thanked Allah and admired me for whatever we have. She said, yes, this is what I did. And whatever we have is a blessing of Allah. And here we can understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not accept his anbiya alayhi salatu was salam, his prophets and messengers to live their lives only for the worldly gain and just to satisfy the needs of their families. And if the families have these type of complaints, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want that type of family to be the family of a prophet. And this is exactly what happened during the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when Ummahat al they demanded that we need more money because they used to get certain amount of food. Money means food. So they were getting certain amount of it and they knew that there is much more that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam can give us. But he's giving it to other causes and he's spending it at different places. So they, uh, they demanded, Ya Rasulullah, we need more. It's not enough for us. Sometime, days go by before we get any food to eat. And the ayahs of the Qur'an were revealed. Ya ayyuhan nabiyyu qul li azwajik. In kuntunna turidna al-hayata al-dunya wa zinataha fata'alayn. Umatta'akunna wa usarrahkunna sarahan jameela. O Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, tell your wives, if you love the worldly gain and the worldly life and the beauty of this world, then come, I'll give you some money and send you back to your homes. You get the money, but go back to your home. You cannot stay at the house of a Prophet of Allah. And when kuntunna turidna Allah wa rasulahu wa dar al-akhirah, if you want Allah, his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the hereafter, then just stay the way you are. Thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for whatever you have. And you will get tremendous reward for choosing this. And of course, all of Ummahat al Mu'mineen, they chose Allah and His Messenger. At that time, Sayyidina Ibrahim والسلام, asked Ismail والسلام, his wife that what do you people normally eat? What's your food here? She said, We get milk and meat. He asked, do you get any bread or anything else to eat with it? She said, no. These are the two things that we normally get to eat. That's our normal food. Milk and meat. With no bread, with nothing else? No. No rice, no bread. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in a hadith, after narrating this, that a person who would try to survive on just this milk and meat anywhere else in the world, he won't be able to survive on this for too long. He won't be able to digest these two things for too long without eating anything else with it. It was only the dua of Ibrahim salam that he made at that time for them. Through that, if in Mecca a person will try to survive only on this, will do it. And he will be able to live his life with only milk and meat, but nowhere else in the world. Because of the dua of Sayyidina Ibrahim salam. But of course, then Ibrahim salam made dua for Makkah and the people of Makkah. Warzuq ahlahu min al-thamarat. Ya Allah, provide the people of this town with all kind of fruit. And subhanAllah, up to this day, you see the dua of Ibrahim salam. The fruit that we find over there, you don't even find it in the countries where it's the time to have that fruit and the season for that fruit. You don't find it over there as good as you find it in Makkah, Mukarram, and Medina, Munawar. And then fruit from all around the world. All kind of food. And all kind of food. And less expensive than you bite in the country of origin. This is only the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the du'as of His Anbiya alayhi salatu wa salam. After Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam built the Kaaba, the Kaaba is there. But now, they don't have all of this technology to broadcast to the world that we have 
reconstructed the Kaaba and informed them what this Kaaba is all about and what to do here by the Kaaba and how to worship Allah at this place. No one knows this place. It's only some people came and started living over here because there is water over there. But how about the rest of the world? No one knows about that place. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam to go on one of the mountains and announce to people to come and do the ibadah by the Kaaba. So Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam said, Ya Allah, sure, it's your order, I will do it, but who's going to listen to me? And how people would listen to me? No one is around here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to him, Ibrahim, your responsibility is to make that announcement and I will do the rest. And here Ibrahim alayhi salam goes on the mountain of Arafah, which is known now as Jabal al-Rahmah. And he made that announcement. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Quran, we said to Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa salam, وَأَذِّنْ فِي النَّاسِ بِالْحَجِ Announce to people to come for Hajj. يَأْتُوكَ رِجَالًا وَعَلَى كُلِّ ضامر. They will come to you on their foot and on lean camels, on camels that will be tired of traveling far distances. يَأْتِينَ مِن كُلِّ فَجٍ عَمِيقٍ They will come from all far distances to Makkah Mukarram. And that was the miracle of Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam. He's making the announcement. And through that announcement, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put the love of the Kaaba in the hearts of all the people. And here, as we just have known about the elevator of Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam, here we see the wireless system that Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam used. And that announcement that gets not only to people's ear, it's getting to people's hearts. And out of nowhere, people, they don't even know where they get this in, got this information from. All the people are talking about Kaaba, Kaaba, Kaaba. Then let's go to Kaaba. And here we find people at that time and people started coming. In large groups, they started coming to Kaaba to perform the tawaf and perform the hajj. And through that, they started learning the deen of Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam and almost all the Arabs became the followers of Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam. There was no shirk, no kufr in Arabia at that time. Then, as we know that at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Arabia was full of idols. 360 idols just by the Kaaba, then there are inside, then there is in every home, every person has his own idol. Where did all of those come from? The first person who brought idols into Arabia and introduced idol worshipping to Arabs was a person called Amr bin Luhay. This person Amr bin Luhay was the leader of a clan called Khuza'a. If you remember, the first clan that moved to Makkah Mukarramah at the time of Sayyidina Ismail alayhi salam, when him and his mother, and his mother Hajar radiallahu anhuma were there, that was a clan of Jurhum. After some time, then of course different clans started moving around that area. Main control of Makkah was in the hands of Jurhum, but there were many other clans that started establishing around Makkah Mukarramah. So at some point in the history, there was a clan called Khuza'a who started having a dispute with Jurhum of who is in charge of the Kaaba. And finally there was a big war between Jurhum and Khuza'a. Jurhum were the ones who moved at the time of Ismail alayhi salam. So in reality, they were the people that were in charge of Kaaba and they were the main residents of Makkah Mukarramah. But now Khuza'a wants to take over that charge because it's an honor. And all the Arabs, they come and 
they respect not only the Kaaba, even the people who are in charge of the Kaaba, who are the caretakers of the Kaaba. So, Huza'a wanted that respect and that honor for themselves. So they had a war with Jurhum, and they defeated Jurhum, and took over Kaaba. As Jurhum realized that they are going to be defeated, what they did was, there was a lot of treasure in the Kaaba. They took all of that, buried all of that in the well of Zamzam, then they covered it with dust. Because Zamzam was the main source of livelihood for the people of Mecca. So they said, okay, if these people of Khuza'a, they are going to take over Mecca, but they won't have water over here. So they will have to struggle for that. And they will suffer. For that purpose, they buried the well of Zamzam. As Jirhum, as Khuza'a took over, they couldn't find that well of Zamzam. So they had to travel far distances out of Mecca to bring water to Mecca Mukarrama. And of course, it was very difficult for them. But they survived with that because there was no other choice. And then we know that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa grandfather, Abdul Muttalib, was the one who was chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to dig that well of Zamzam again. Inshallah, we'll talk about it once we get there to that point. Khuza'a ruled Makkah Mukarramah for about 400 years, more or less. During that time, Amr bin Luhay was, during that period, at one time in the history, Amr bin Luhay was the leader of Khuza'a. He was a very powerful person because of his wealth, because he was one of the wealthiest people in that area. So because of that he became the leader of Khuza'a and at the same time his word was the final word. One day he went to Syria for a business trip. Over there he saw some people worshipping idols. It was a clan called Amalika. They were worshipping idols. It was something new for him. He had never seen something like this before. So he asked them, what is this? They said, these are our idols. So don't you people believe in Allah? No, no, we believe in Allah. We believe in Allah. But since we cannot talk to Allah directly, He's too great. So what we do is, we have these idols, we talk to these idols. And then they connect us to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whenever we have a difficulty, instead of running to Allah all the time, He's too great. We don't want to disturb Him all the time. So then instead of going to Him for all the things and disturbing Him all the time, we come and talk to these ones. So when we have needs in our community, when we have difficulties, when enemies are attacking us, we come and talk to these idols and they help us. Do they help in all the matters? He said, yeah. they said yes. You talk to them and they, they do it for you. Because then they connect to Allah and they talk to Allah and they know their way. He liked the idea. He said, we don't have water in Mecca. And it looks me, to me that yes, Allah is very great and we cannot talk to Him, we shouldn't talk to Him. So, therefore I'll take one of these and who knows, He will bring us water over there. So they gave him one of the idols that they had over there that was called Hubl. And later on this was one of the very famous idols of Quraysh. So Amr bin Luhay took that idol over there and he introduced the idol worshipping in Arabia and of course it started from Makkah. Because he was from Makkah. He was the leader of Khuza'a. And before going any further, just a reminder here. The thing that brought the idol worshipping into Arabia, when you look at the situation, it was because of two things. Number one, those people 
selecting Amr bin Luhay as the leader and giving him the authority of making any decisions about their lives. And this person was considered to be the authority because of his wealth. So of course, they chose a wrong, they had a wrong criteria of choosing the leader and therefore that person turned out and came out to be the reason for misleading not only them, the whole clan and the whole nation. The second thing is, why did Amr bin Luhayl like the idea of idols? Because we are in difficulty. They told him that when you, have, you are in difficulties, then the help, they can get you the water if you want in Mecca. They can, at any time when people attack you over there, these idols will help you. We find many times, Muslims, believers, who believe in Allah, they are very knowledgeable about their deen, and they believe in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa they are well informed about this iman. But when a type of difficulty and a hardship comes, they run into things that are against the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And some people will fall into magicians doing different type of magics. Some people will run towards the kuffar who would use things that are totally against the sharia. This is exactly what happened to Amr bin Luhay. And this, is what, this was the cause of misleading the whole nation. And this is how many times these type of kuffar and shirk comes into the families. When they run into a difficulty, into hardship. And then they start getting everyone's opinion and people start giving them all strange opinions about doing things that may be totally against Islam. But at that time the person forgets deen, forgets everyone, everything else and he only wants to get over that situation. So we have to be careful in these type of difficulties. We should only do what is allowed by the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and then put our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As idol worshipping started in Arabia, and people started worshipping these idols, so they needed more of these, and they started making more and more of these idols. To the extent, it went to the extent that now they started having idols in every home and finally it became a tradition that even when they are going out on a journey, they will keep some small idols so that they will take with them during their journeys to save them from hardship so they will worship them at some point in their journeys every day they will spend little time worshipping those idols. In other words, everyone is having a doll to play with. We're interesting story that we find of Sayyidina Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anhu who says once he forgot he was going out on a journey and he forgot to take caught to caught his Lord with him. He forgot to take the idol with him. So it's night time. He remembers, oh... I, he checks his baggage. I don't have my idol with me. I, who I'm going to worship today? But I'm supposed to worship. I don't want to just go to sleep and then get affected by some of these evil spirits or jinns or something like this. So let me do something. And finally, he gets all of his dates together, puts it together, makes an idol out of the date, and starts worshiping that idol. Now, it's time for dinner. No dinner now because all the days are used in making the idol. So he said, I decided just to go to sleep without eating anything. As I'm laying down, I can't go to sleep. I'm too hungry. So I started fighting with my thoughts. What should I do? I have little food, but I made idol of it and I worshipped it already. Now that's my idol. That's my Lord. I can't eat that. Then he said, okay, later as I'm getting too hungry, I can't go to sleep, I said to myself, how about just eating the hands of it? 
and he started eating the hands of that idol. Broke the hands and ate that date. But that wasn't enough. It's a small idol that made out of few dates. So he said finally he decided to eat up the whole idol and ate up all of those dates. Shows that with all the belief and with the, uh, the respect that they had for idols, it was in the back of their minds that these are not the real gods. These are not supposed to be worshipped. And they mean nothing. This is why a person is even willing to eat it up after worshipping it. As far as Amr bin Luhay, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says in the hadith, hadith is in Muslim Ahmad, I saw Amr bin Luhay, he was pulling his intestines in the hellfire. The first person who changed the deen of the Arabs and brought the idol worshipping into Arabs. A person who invites people to an evil, he will get the sin for doing that evil and for every person who will do that sin and commit that sin and do that evil for as long as that evil will exist. So that Amr bin Luhay took that responsibility of getting the sin of every person that was worshipping idol in Arabia. This is how idol worshipping came. But we know that there were some clans of Arabs that were Christians and some were Jews. How did these religions come over there? Of course, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's sign were mentioned in Torah and Injil. And at that time, people were waiting for this Prophet of Allah as they saw all the changes in the world. So they were waiting for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and many of these Jews and Christians as they see the, saw the signs, they knew that now it's almost the time for that Prophet to come. So they, were, they also had the description of uh, his town where he is going to come to and where he would immigrate to and many different signs of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam and things related to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam were mentioned. In their books. So many of them that would go out, travel around the world at different places to see if they can find that place. And some of them who came out of Sham, out of Syria, they found that place in Yathrib, a place that was called Yathrib, later on called Medina Munawwara. So they chose Medina Munawwara for their residence and the lived over there waiting for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And as we know from our history that they used to tell the people of Ansar all the time that a prophet of Allah is going to come, we will be his followers and once we follow him then we'll take over all of you people. This is how the people of Ansar knew about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they were ready and looking forward for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So for this reason many of these people came to uh, different locations in Arabia looking for that place where the last Prophet of Allah would come and immigrate to. One of the kings of Yemen whose name was Tubban As'ad. <laughs> he also as he heard about the people of Medina and they are waiting for a prophet to come and some people indicated to him that the prophet might be out of Arabs also. So he made his son live in Medina Munawwara with the hope who knows might be his son. Or at least his son will follow the, that prophet and we will get the honor of having one of us following to be the, one of the first followers of that prophet. But it so happened during that time, someone killed his son. So he took a large army to attack Medina Munawwara and his intention was to just wipe it out. As he went over there and started having a war with those people, he found some amazing things over there. One of them was 
these people would fight him during the daytime, but night time, they will bring him all the food and they will host the, the whole army. So he asked, why you people are doing this? We are your enemies, we came to kill you people. They said, yes, that's true. But in our books, according to our, the teachings of our prophets, we cannot let you people starve to death. And you have no other source of getting your food. So here we have to offer you these things. He was impressed by that. But of course, arrogance is still there. I'm going to wipe the whole town out. Because someone here killed my son. At that time, two of the Jewish rabbis went to him, approached him, and they took the Torah with him, showed him all the signs of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa that were in Torah. And they said to him, look, he is going to come to this town. Therefore, there is no way you will be able to wipe out this town. This town will be there. And if you try it even more, you may receive, get a punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of course, he's already impressed by those people. He's finding an excuse to stop the war. His arrogance does not allow him just to say, okay, because these people are too nice, I'm not going to fight them. But here he says, no, because of that prophet that is coming, I'll stop this war. And he stopped the war, but requested both of these Jewish rabbis to go with him to Yemen. So that they can teach the people of Yemen about this religion, because he's very impressed by this religion. They accepted to go with him because it's an opportunity to preach the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they went with him. On their way, as they were going back to Yemen, Another clan came. That was the clan of Huzail. This clan of Huzail, they were against the people of Yemen and against the people of Makkah. And who was ruling Makkah at that time? Huza'ah, as we just talked about it. Huza'ah were ruling it. Amr bin al-Hayy was from Huza'ah. The ones that took over Jerusalem. So this Huzail was against Huza'ah and they were against the people of Yemen. They found it a good opportunity to start a war between these two groups. So they went to Taban, the king of Yemen, who came there. And they said to him, would you like to go back with a lot of treasure, gold, silver, and you name it. And you will find it there. He said, sure, where is it? They said, inside the Kaaba. But these people of Khuzaa won't allow you to take any of that if without having a war. But you know, it's a small group. You, you can very easily take over these people. When these two Jewish rabbis heard about that, they said to Taban, you better not listen to these people. Because Kaaba is the house of Allah. And as Allah protected his town, the town of his prophet in Medina, in Yathrib, he will protect his own house also. So don't even think of doing anything like that. In fact, because now you had a thought of hurting that place, so you better go and have some respect for the place and show your respect for the place and perform the tawaf of the Kaaba. So he went to Makkah Mukarramah to pay his respect to Kaaba. Night time when he went to sleep, he saw a dream that He's applying a cover on top of the Kaaba. He asked those Jewish leaders, rabbis, what does this dream mean? And they said, it's very clear. It's a way of respecting it. So, and you have all the means of making that type of covering for the Kaaba. So make that type of covering for the Kaaba and apply it on the Kaaba. And he did it. He was the first person that we know in the history to put that cover on top of the Kaaba. They never used to have a cover on top of it before that. Now, after that, all the different rulers and different kings of Arabs, you know, different small clans of Arabs, and each of them have their own leader, their king, their leaders. So each of them wanted to have that respect. Of course, if they don't rule Mecca, and if they don't have uh, the control over the Kaaba, at least they can have this respect by having a cover on the Kaaba. So they all started making covers 
to put it on the Kaaba. The question came that if every person wants to put it, if they would take out the cover of the person of the, who had it over there previous, prior to this person, there will be a war between these two clans. So the person who wants to put it after Tuban, he will have to fight Tuban. Tuban is going to be offended that why did you take my cover off? So they came to a decision. Each clan that wants to make, put a cover on top of the Kaaba, should put cover on top of this cover. So, no cover will be taken out. It will just continue to keep on putting it one hour or other. Finally, Khuza'a came to a point to decide and determine, they had their engineers or whoever telling them, if you continue this way, the Kaaba will come down with the weight of all of these covers that, um, that is on it now. Since then, they decided we will have only one cover a year and we will take all of these covers out. Now one person will be able to put that cover to have the cover on the Kaaba and Khuza'a will tell the people who will be putting the cover on the Kaaba for this year. And now we know it's the same tradition that the cover of the Kaaba changes once a year. They used to make that cover in different parts of the world and uh, different countries used to have the uh, honor of uh, having that cover and once I won't name no countries nothing and no people although the history is there and this is part of the history that a cover was made or I think it's part of the history of the Kaaba a cover was made in Pakistan and there was one of the people who was running for I don't know what position and looking for votes so as the cover was made he took the cover of the Kaaba with him and going throughout the country showing people and people are kissing it kissing the train in which the cover was it still did not go on the Kaaba yet but a good way of having of making good name so that he can have the vote later on he will get popular that oh this great person was the one who was going with the cover of the Kaaba throughout the country. And after that, they started making it in some other countries, and then finally now they make it in Makkah Mukarramah. Anyway, the Stuban went with these two Jewish rabbis back to Yemen. It's time now to introduce Judaism to the people of Yemen. See, we are talking about how these religions are coming into them. So, they are in Medina Munawwara. Idol worship came, worshiping came through Amr bin Luhay. There are Jews in Medina Munawwara. And there were Jews and Christians as we just mentioned. In different parts of Arabia because they were looking for a place where Prophet ﷺ would come. And through the signs they know that the time is close. When these two Jewish rabbis went to Yemen, the people of Yemen used to worship fire at that time. They refused to follow this religion. And finally, because the king is asking them that, okay, here, these people are teaching us, and they have books with them, and you see virtuous people, you see people who are respectable people, what's wrong in following their religion? So they said, we will make the fire to determine. Fire is the Lord, wa billah. So the fire will determine what we are going to worship. Okay, what's the way to that? They had a way for that also. They used to have small rooms built especially for this purpose. Fireproof room. And they used to put a lot of fuel into that room and put a fire in the room and then have the, both the parties stand in front of the door of that room. Once they see the fire is growing big, they will open the door of the room. So, whichever direction the fire will proceed first. Which, that means that person is wrong. So they had these two Jewish rabbis standing over there, and they were reciting the Torah. And their own leaders, leaders of the file worshippers, and those were the fortune tellers. Who else would be leading? So, fortune teller is there telling people, this is what will happen, this will happen, and they are connected to the jinns. So they stood over there, and they started talking to their jinns. 
as these people opened the door to that room, the fire started going towards these fortune tellers. So they ran away. People got upset with them that you are our leaders, you are putting us down, you humiliated the whole country. Go back, stand there. They made them go back and stand over there, they closed the door now again, put the fire on again and again as they tied these people over there. No one is allowed to run, no one will be able to run. Let the fire, let the fire decide. And here, as they opened the door, the fire again went towards the direction of those uh, fortune tellers and burned them down. As people saw that, many people over there accepted Judaism. And this is how this religion went over there. There were some Christians, still some fire worshippers who are stubborn, they didn't want to change. Many Jews. And there were idol worshippers also because they were Arabs and they were affected by what Huza'a was introducing, introducing in Makkah Mukarramah. After Thuban died, his son, whose name was Hassan, took over the rule of Yemen and he became the king of Yemen. Hassan was totally different than his father. Very arrogant. And his main dream was to rule the whole world. So it's nothing new when people dream these type of dreams throughout the history. Even at that time, with no means and no technology, he is dreaming of ruling the whole world. He asked the people, which is the most powerful country in the world? They said, it's Persia. Okay, then the first country I'll take care of is Persia. And he prepared an army and started proceeding in that direction. Inshallah, in our next session, we will talk about what happened and what were the results of him leaving Yemen. Inshallah, we will continue from there in our next session. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين والمسلمات وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين.